she didn't believe that she would have to leave her town and she knew nothing else. She was, had been educated only up to the fourth grade. She had five children at the time. Only one of them was a teenager and the others were quite young. And then, you know what happened. Partition was about to be announced. But even then they didn't believe that it was going to happen. So she thought she would take her four children and go to India or the Indian side as they had started calling it and come back when things calm down. I think many of you have heard the story before. So 1947, with four young children in tow, dressed in white because she was a widow, she left for India. And when she arrived in India, a month later, partition was announced. And she realized that she had four young children and not a penny to her name. And so what she did, which was unheard of at the time, and everybody advised her against it, was that she got on a train to go back to Peshawar to bring some gold back so she could raise her children. And everyone told her goodbye because we will never see you again. As many of you know, trains in those days between what was the newly created Pakistan and India were filled with dead bodies from both sides. Because people had gone mad and they were killing and raping and pillaging and murdering and torturing each other. My grandmother got on that train, went back, one of her Muslim friends helped her smuggle some gold in a box of bread. And she got that and came back on a train which was filled with dead bodies. She never talked about this. I never heard her talk about it. But everybody in the family talked about, talked about it because she became a legend. No one expected her to come back alive. She did. She raised her children. Each one of them went to college. I feel like I'm helping some people perhaps <coughs> for healing. But I'm also inspired by just about every story I hear. I'm moved that people can go on after such trauma and build lives for themselves, for their children, like my grandmother. I too was moved uh, by the fact that there was a big discrepancy between what I heard in my family versus what I learned in school, which was almost nothing. So I moved to the US when I was 10. In India, I had not heard about it in school. I only learned about it through my family. But in the US, uh, I grew up in Florida, where I definitely didn't hear about it in school, where I think world history in Florida mostly covers uh, only European history, right? I know in California it's different, it is more all encompassing. Um, so that was always something that bothered me because as someone who was South Asian, I, I felt very disconnected from my culture. And I was always a little bit, uh, you know, curious why it was not covered in school. And when I tried to tell my teachers about it in high school that you know, we studied the Holocaust in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that something similar happened in South Asia, they would say that maybe it was not that important because it's not in our textbooks. So textbook you know, knowledge sort of legitimizes, or textbooks sort of legitimize knowledge in that way. Um, and so as I grew up, of course I lost my grandmother along the way. I never recorded her story. Uh, but I was in Hiroshima in 2008, and I was very moved by the peace memorial there the archives, because when you watch the stories, it's, it's much more powerful than you know the movies that you watch on the bomb and the books that you read. You can actually see how it affected real people, how they could no longer have children and live normal lives because they were affected by the bomb. Um, and so I thought that was very moving, and it was instantaneous. It was like, okay, we need to do this for partition, because people need to hear it from my grandma and not me, because they don't believe me when I tell them. Uh, so I had that thought in the back of my mind in 2008, um, and when I came back, actually I was in India in 2009, uh, I started collecting stories, I, I had a video camera that was always on me since I was a teenager, and uh, or early 20s, and I started recording stories, very rudimentary. I moved out to California, I did not know anybody, um, so I 
kind of didn't collect any stories. 2010, I was visiting my grandmother's brother. He was 95 in India, and I didn't have my camera with me. So he asked me to come back you know, next time with my camera so I could record his story. And he was 95. He was in his 30s during partition. He knew quite a bit at that time. Uh, but next time never happened because in June that year, he passed away. And for me, that was like a wake-up call. Like, wow, he left us. And I mean, not only did we lose a family member, but we lost this whole legacy that we're never going to know. And there are so many other individuals like that who have these stories that are leaving us. And um, you know, they're taking with them a part of our story, a part of my story, even if I'm not related to them. They're taking with them, with them um, knowledge that has not been recorded. Uh, and you know what happens when there's incomplete knowledge out there. We fill it in with our imagination, and we sort of write history the way we want to. Um, and that's why it's so important, I think, to record the people's history, because these are bits of knowledge that have not been recorded. And we need to, for those of us who've inherited this state of affairs, especially, uh, we want to connect the dots. And for us, it's important to have that knowledge. Now, it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Babsi Sidwa today. But really, Dr. Babsi Sidwa needs no introduction. As all of you know, Dr. Sidwa is an award-winning Pakistani novelist and acclaimed author, essayist, and playwright, perhaps best known for her book, Cracking India. Well, hi, everybody. <coughs> Wonderful to see you all here. Uh, is the mic on? I'm yapping away without the mic. <laughs> but you know, we, I'm a Parsi, and in Bombay, we are known as Kagra Khao. How many of you know that? Because we yak too much. So from that point of view, anyway, I first would like to thank Rina very much for the really touching introduction, for taking so much interest in recording the history. You know, we, we don't have an institution like the Holocaust survivors. You know, we are. I am. A partition survivor. And so there are many partition survivors here. And we are dying out very fast. We better record our histories before we all pass away. And uh, the other thing I wanted to touch upon, I was in Delhi for the filming of the movie Earth. And at that time, there was not a soul I met who did not say they did not origi originally come from the home. They all had such a strong Lahori connections. And they said, next time you come, bring us some Lahori water. You know, it was so touching. It was so nostalgic. Anyway, I really uh, applaud Bonita and Rina and everybody who's taking part in this marvelous project. Because look at the amount of stories the Holocaust has developed. Look at the amount of pain that has been recorded and lessons learned from history. And if we don't record our stories, then we will not be able to learn a lesson from history. Not that we ever will, I doubt. You know, because the slaughtering has been going on forever and ever. We have to face the fact that at times of anarchy, somehow or other, men lose their mental balance and Greed comes into the forefront. Mothers are trying to protect their children, and the men are out for revenge and for all, all the reasons opposed to what women are, I think. I think this is my very personal opinion. And this history has to be recorded. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now oh, I'd like to invite a, a few people uh, up here on stage, because we're going to be conducting a panel. Uh, Mr. Hardev Singh Grewal. Please come and join us. Mr. Shani Ali. Farhana Aproz. And, and we are also need Dr. Sidwa. I think she may still be in the back there. And I, in 47, I was 10 years old, and I distinctly remember what happened in my own village? I have my family or I, we haven't moved from Pakistan. We were already in India. So around that time in August 47, uh, 
there was isolated killings in villages here and there people used to hear that this thing happened so many people got killed at certain village in my own village elderly people came up with a novel idea how to protect uh, or save i don't know whether i'm using the right words or not the local population a muslim population what they thought of as to ask them to become muslims to convert to uh, sorry to convert to sikhism maybe the muslim population didn't have a choice out of fear they did what they did so the village people arranged for several days whatever needs to be done so that they become baptized and it so happened most of them were baptized so this thing went to other villages that gujarwal people have done this thing so some of the unsocial elements did not like it so they came from other villages i distinctly remember one morning 7 o'clock i know where i was there was gunfire constant gunfire outside the village the unsocial elements came from outside they went from door to door of muslim people and either they shot them killed them the homes were put on fire and the look what bothers me the most the other sick people the most in village population didn't do a thing one early morning we heard we woke up to a loud noise noises and my mother she woke up and she went upstairs on the roof there were flat roofs of, of houses so she went to the on the roof to find out what's going on and me and my brother followed her we got up there i still remember i saw um hundreds of people surrounding the village there was sword drawn spears and other uh, arms and shining in the early morning sun uh we my wa- uh, mother was there she didn't know what to do and then my uncle came running and he told us to follow him so the mother came downstairs and we followed her too we all went to center of the village there was a big room maybe somebody's house and my all, there when we got there there was about 100 women and children all into their one big room and we got there too so my uncle told us to stay there until they come back if they come back um all the men decided that that was the best way out they could defend as as long as they can and if not then see what happens so a man went away so there was two three male left in the room and there were children so we waited waited there was two three hours but it seemed like a eternity to me there was no water it was hard day and children young very young children were crying but there was no help mm-hmm. out of sudden um somebody knocked the door they were shouting to open the door and nobody would open the door and uh, then we heard, i heard the noise from the roof and somebody broke the roof made a hole and shouted to open the door otherwise they will put the uh, set the room on fire and that's what's going to happen so somebody in the room in the room said that well we are going to die anyway so why not open the door so the, somebody opened the door 
and then the, I saw a gunman standing at the door. He was killing all the male, adults, even children, uh, and letting girls and women go through. My mother saw that, and she formed two small sheets, white sheets, and she wrapped around me and my brother, and so that we look like girls. We passed through the room, and we were guided to a big, huge tree, I still remember, and asked, they asked us to sit down there. When I got out, I saw bodies, blood around. <coughs> fires and uh, people uh, screaming for help, but there was no help. So we sat down there, and first there was gunmen standing there. He told all the women to take the jewelry out, off. So the women started taking the jewelry off, and then whoever couldn't, it was snatched from their ears, from their necks. And then all of a sudden, and then they separated young girls out, and uh, then they start killing. My two aunties was on my side, stick there, and one guy with the axe uh, uh, cut them off their neck. So. They fell over, and then my brother, he must have been about 11 years old at that time. I was about seven. So he ran to escape. And one guy came with a spear and hit him, and he fell. My mother saw that, and she ran and fell over him to save him. They were both killed there. The gunman was about 10 feet away from me. He, he shot at me a few times, but he missed. I was standing there stunned. I was not Fearful, I was not, I was not thinking about anything, I was stunned. And then all of a sudden, I still feel that way. Uh, fear went through my body, like a lightning. And I ran. When I ran, I bumped into one uh, I ran and one guy with a spear came to kill me. As soon as he got close to me, I bumped into another person who was killing too. And as soon as I bumped to him, I looked at him. He held my hand and the other guy tried to kill me. He said, don't. He said, why? He said, I want to take the child with me. So he took me with him, and when they left, everybody went, left the village, and I and other girls, they set aside. We all walked from there to Ranguwala. There, when the elders find out what happened of their village, they were sick and Hindu village. So they came up, met those people who were taking those girls and me, and told them this is not the way it should be done. They should be released. We will take them to Patiala, which was close by somewhere, because there the uh, Nawab of that Patiala was Muslim, so there was no rights there, no killing there. So they said that they will we'll take these girls and uh, whoever is here there to uh, decide whatever going to happen, or at least they'll be safe there. So, but then uh, the people, those young people who, who got those girls, they said, we're going to burn your village too if you want, let us go. So 
I remember that one old person, guy, he was literally crying. Because he could help. And then we left the village and then everybody split up. The guy who had me, he was, I don't know where he was taking me or whatever he was going to do with me. We walked about two nights and days. He would leave me sometime in the, uh, in the grown up crops so that I could hide there and go to the village, get some food and come back and I will eat. And then we go, and sometime I went with him in the village. He was afraid that somebody may ask who I was and I could be killed. So after that, he took me to a village, was close by to Ludhiana, where he left me with a family who wanted me somehow. They wanted a small child, although they had three children of their own. So um, he left me there, and uh, they introduced me to uh, their children. They converted me to Sikhism, they gave me a new name, and I just started living there. They were a very nice family. They treated me well. I used to go with them to the farm to help them wherever I could. So I sort of start another kind of normal life. But it didn't last long either. Um, as I, Mr. Garewal said that there was an agreement between India and Pakistan to recover whoever was left there on both sides of the border to pick them over to the respective countries. So um, military found out about me, and they came and wanted to take me with them. And I was still very traumatized, and I didn't know what the Pakistan was and what India was. And they didn't want to go. So I was crying, and uh, one uh, soldier took me around and told me there's nothing nothing is going to happen to me and uh, I will be okay. So he told me a few things and told me about my village and then from there I just calmed down and then it took me to Ludhiana where I was stayed there in a refugee camp. So when there was about 200 people they put us into buses and took us to Lahore refugee camp. Two years ago I was at a grocery store in Sunnyvale as I was coming out, there was a poster on the wall, you know, how we all see the flyers. And it, it, this one said, 1947 Partition Archive, share your story, volunteer, join us, donate. So I emailed the email address that was listed there. And um, actually, when I saw the flyer, my first thought was, what took them so long? <laughs> and then I took the little bitty penny thingy with email address and then emailed them. And, it, and someone replied to my email, and it was Gunita. And when I got to know them more, I found out it was really not them. It was her who was running 1947 Partition Archives. And then later on, I got to meet a lot more volunteers, Rina, Iram, <coughs> Natasha, Maya, and many others. I'm sorry if I'm not mentioning your name. Last year, I went to Bangladesh to collect stories. There was five of us who went to South Asia, and I was the one who went to Bangladesh. I collected many stories, people who went to the east side and the west side. I want to tell you a little bit about these specific people that I interviewed, the Biharis in Bangladesh. When, when partition happened, a large number of people from Bihar and Uttar Pradesh came to East, east Pakistan because that was closest for them. And this was East Pakistan, and they settled. Remember, they left everything back, and they came to this new land. Who knew, in 24 years, this is going to be Bangladesh. So all of a sudden, you are not in Pakistan, you are in a new land. And if you are a Bihari, you are actually a minority, an outsider. So the government of Bangladesh gave them the op um, option. Do you want to go back to Pakistan, or do you want to stay in Bangladesh? Most of them decided to opt for Pakistan. So they were put in refugee camps in different parts of Bangladesh. There are about 100 of them. When I went to Bangladesh in 2002, there were about 160,000 Urdu-speaking people living in refugee camps for 40 plus years. I could not believe it. 
I saw it with my own eyes. Many of you tell, tell us our story, your stories about going to refugee camps and how horrible it was. Imagine living in one of them for 40 some years. They had their families, they had their children, they're having their grandchildren in those camps. I have invited Ijaz Bai to start this with the first few verses of Amrita Pritam's Varisha, Poem to Varisha. कोई अगला वर्का भोल एक रोई सी पंजाब की तू लिख लिख बारे वह अज लख रोंद तेन वारी शाह कह आए हाथ उठाए हम जी हम जिन्हें रस्म दुआ याद नहीं हम जिन्हें सोज मुहब के सिवा कोई बुत कोई खुदा याद नहीं आए हाथ उठाए हम भी आइए अर्ज गुजारे की निगारे जहर इमरोज में शीरी फरदा भर दे जो जिन्हें ताब गिरा बारी आयाम नहीं उनकी पलकों पे शब रोज को हल्का आए हाथ उठाए हम भी जिनका दिन पैर भी कसब रिया है उनको हिम्मत कुफर मिले जुर्रत तहतीक मिले जिनके सर मुंतजरे तेग जफाए उनको दस्त कात को झटक देने की तोफीक मिले आइए हाथ उठाए हम भी हम जिन्हें रस्म दुआ याद नहीं हम जिन्हें सोज मुहब के सिवा कोई बुत कोई खुदा याद इन काली सदियों के सर से जब रात का आचर धर के था इन काली सदियों के सर से जब रात का आचर धर के गा जब दुख के बादल पिघलेंगे जब सुख का सागर छलकेगा जब अंबर झूम के नाचेगा जब धरती नगमे गाएगी वो सुबह कभी तो आएगी 
वो सुबह कभी तो आएगी माना के अभी तेरे मेरे अर मानो की कीमत कुछ भी नहीं माना के अभी तेरे मेरे अर मानो की कीमत कुछ भी नहीं मिट्टी का भी कुछ है मोल मगर इंसानों की कीमत कुछ भी नहीं इंसानों की इज्जत जब झूठे सिक्के में न तोली जाएगी वो सुबह कभी तो आएगी वो सुबह कभी तो आएगी वो सुबह कभी तो आएगी वो सुबह कभी